TNO, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. Big applause for our first speakers. Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joel van Geest. I'm here together with my colleague uh, Edwin Harmsma, who's somewhere behind there. Uh, we are from TNO. Uh, like I said, uh, TNO is a research organization, applied uh, research organization in the Netherlands. Um, we have around 2,500 employees. Uh, me and Edwin, we are from Groningen, but uh, our department is also in The Hague. We do uh, lots of cool stuff with IT. <laughs> It's too much to mention what we do. It's a very broad, uh, many domains we work in. But we also work uh, quite a lot with Docker. Uh, we are quite early adapters. Uh, we've been using, obviously, continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery before Docker existed. Uh, but we now combine the two worlds. And tonight we will give a presentation about um, how we do that, what problems we encountered, and uh, hopefully we can uh, learn from each other. Uh, before I start uh, this presentation, I'd like to start with some developments in the Docker world. There's always something going on, obviously, in this uh, fast-moving uh, IT world. Um, maybe some of you, some of you, of it, you've already heard. Uh, the recent version, Docker 1.12, uh, which caused quite a well, lots of people are happy with it, but also lots of people are not that happy with it, with the stability of uh, Docker, especially the swarm uh, running containers on multiple machines. You see this icon here, which is a fork icon. There are, easy, there are even some rumors that big, uh, some big enterprise companies are planning to do a fork with Docker, since they don't like the cooperation behind Docker, the way they're moving. Um, interesting movements, something to keep, uh, keep an eye on. You see also some, uh, some members in the community moving towards uh, Rocket. Um, another way to run containers, a bit more the Unix way, lightweight. Um, it does support Docker in a way. You see uh, the Microsoft uh, Windows logo there, Perfect Strangers. Um, you could already run uh, like native Windows containers with the technical preview of Windows Server 2016. I believe yesterday the general available release was announced. Very interesting movements. And uh, you also see that with DCOS, Mesosphere, um, running really lots of containers for big data processing and so on. Microsoft also supports them a lot, so especially if you want to use Spark, or other big data tooling uh, in hybrid solutions, uh, then that's also interesting because right now I believe it only supports Linux uh, properly. So interesting movements and I'm sure there's a lot more going on but these are the ones I found. I'm not sure about the level, it's always interesting on the meetup uh, how, well, how, how, how familiar everybody is with the technology. Just one quick slide about Docker. We assume some quite a big basic level of Docker here but this slide recaps it a bit. What is Docker? We have a developer. Um, developer can write a specification, a Microsoft specification in a Docker file. Um, in the early days you had bare metal, you had virtual machines and Docker is really a lightweight machine to ship, uh, to ship software in small containers. So you can write in a Docker file how, how your uh, Docker container should, uh, should be. You can then build it and ship it to a registry, to a public hub or in a private hub if you want to use that, in a private registry. And um, Docker is aiming towards microservice architecture, so one, small pieces of software in small containers, and together you form uh, a set of containers. Um, so the developer also writes like a container composition specification, like a Docker Compose file or some other files if you're using Kubernetes. Or and these containers can talk to each other and you can run them in several environments. So you can run them in your, on your notebook or in the cloud and they all behave the same. Unlike uh, virtual machines where you had like a readme file or you could use Ansible, blah, 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 but it's much easier with Docker. We will also talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, gets more and more popular with DevOps teams and so on. The basic idea, you start with developing software, at the end you want something good production, but there are lots of steps in between. You co uh, commit your code, you, you want to build it, uh, unit testing, integration testing, maybe some access, acceptance testing. In the early, early days you did this uh, oftentimes manually, but with continuous integration you want this whole pipeline to be automated. From code commits, and in a few minutes of time or even quicker you want it 
either in production, like maybe Instagram does, 50 times a day, they say, and, um, or a developed environment, or a staging environment. <coughs> By the way, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt, uh, interrupt us. So what do you need for a proper continuous integration, continuous delivery environment together with containers? You need multiple environments, like I said. Uh, you want a developed environment where the developers always test the software. You want maybe a staging environment that is like production, but just to do the final checks. And a production environment where the customers uh, use your software. You probably also want multiple hosts. Uh, most of the applications typically run on multiple hosts, especially with containers, that gets interesting. You want automated tests and automated builds. Uh, you don't want to build the software all yourself on your notebook, although you can. You need a container registry, some place where you store the compiled or the built uh, container. You definitely want APIs to different components in your build pipeline. Uh, for example, whenever you do a git push that something gets triggered, uh, whenever a container is built and it is brought into uh, production or in develop. You want something like seamless updating, especially for your uh, production environment, that the user does not notice that you're upgrading your containers. Logging and traceability, what if something goes wrong? And uh, performance, uh, this is only non-functional, I think. Uh, it's also important because it should be quick. You don't want a git push and then wait 10 minutes and uh, you've already done three other pushes. You have a question. I'm curious about the API to components. Is that like a, <clears throat> a health checking API or is that the actual function here? That too. Also an API for your production environment so that you can do health checks on your containers. What if, the, what if it does not respond within so much time on a specific REST uh, endpoint or so? But also in other parts of your whole continuous integration pipeline. So like I said, a git push. So somewhere, whatever you use, GitLab, GitHub, uh, there should be a trigger after you push, do a code commit, something should uh, trigger that and build your Docker container for you. You don't want to do that uh, on your own notebook, do a Docker build, Docker push. You can, but not in a continuous integration pipeline. <coughs> Rancher, who has heard of Rancher before? Heard. Wow, nice, good. We did this at Docker Grand Meetup a few months ago, and then it was a lot less. So either it's getting more popular or it has to do with the uh, location, I don't know. <laughs> either way, uh, we use uh, Rancher a lot to fulfill the requirements on the previous slides. So let me still introduce Rancher to you, although it's, to some it is very familiar, but maybe you will learn some new features about this. What is Rancher? Um, Rancher is a very nice tooling to, uh, for, well it does a lot. Um, one of the nicest things about Rancher, it allows you to run Docker containers on multiple hosts on multiple environments. The requirement I mentioned earlier, so you can run a container on your notebook, you can run it in the cloud, uh, wherever you want. Um, also it does authentication, separation of environments using uh, user management, audit trails. It can do scaling for you, bit preliminary, uh, but it can do it with health checks, auto scaling as well. It has a very nice service catalog. Uh, it has a nice web interface for the, for the developer um, or another type of user where you can have a set, like a Rancher Compose file, where you can have a set of containers. Uh, you can ask questions to the user, like the MySQL use, default user and the password and so on. And you can easily deploy it to, to, uh, to, uh, to multiple machines. It does load balancing for you. It also does distributed storage with Convoy. So you don't have to store your volumes on the same machine, but you can use a distributed pool of machines. And it has a very nice API. Remember, API important because we want to automatically upgrade containers when you build software. So this is just uh, some of the features. How does Rancher work? Rancher itself runs in containers. So here we have three hosts. On one of them, we have a container, which is the Rancher server. This is where the API runs, this is where the uh, web interface runs, which I will show you in a minute, and lots of other components. And you can manually add more hosts to your uh, environment in, in Rancher. 
And on each of those hosts, uh, a Rancher Agent container will boot up. And this Rancher Agent container does a lot for you. It uh, does, for example, a VPN connection if it runs in Azure or somewhere else. And it will talk to the server so that, for example, when a user in the server in the web interface wants to deploy some containers, that it can instruct the agent container, which always runs privileged because it needs to boot up other containers, can do that. This is like internal hosts on the same network, but it can also work on Amazon, Azure, Rackspace. I believe maybe one or two others. Can you have an inter-provider uh, cluster? Like, can I have one host in Amazon and the other one running in Azure and the other one in Rackspace and the three of them belong into the same cluster? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can all put them in the same environment and then, uh, then they will all have the same network. Uh, a local network. And how do they talk to each other? How, when you bring a agent up, how do you let it know about the server? About the server? Uh, it's, it's quite easy. When you have the web interface of Rancher, you can say, I want to add a new host. Then it will provide you a line of code with a docker run instruction, which contains the Rancher agent, which it will pull from the public hub. And it also contains some environment variables or some settings, like the API key, and where it can reach the server. And once you have a new agent, for example, first you have one in Amazon, then in Azure, then this one will talk to the Rancher server, and then it is part of the environment. And it will talk to each other through a VPN connection. Um, so maybe some of you people are like, uh, wait a minute, why would I need Rancher? We have maybe Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos. So why would you need Rancher? Well, there's some functionalities that Rancher provides on top of these. Rancher supports all of these uh, orchestrators. Cattle is from Rancher themselves. In the early days they advised to use Cattle, but nowadays they more lean towards the ladder tree. Mesos is pretty new to them. Um, it depends on your application, your use case, which uh, orchestrator you want to use. Uh, Swarm, like I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, 1.12, yeah, they changed a lot of the API, so a lot of changes there, but it is pretty easy to set up um, compared to Mesos and Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like it supports up to 1,000 containers. Uh, it's, it's made by Google. They know very well how to do their infrastructure. So if you want production-ready uh, Docker, um, then Kubernetes is a good choice. They have like replication controllers. What if a container goes down, it will bring it up again. Uh, Mesos is usually for like, it supports lots of frameworks you can uh, p uh, choose from. It has very well scheduling, so for task scheduling it is uh, very good. Uh, it supports, I believe, up to 30, 40, 50 thousands of containers in, uh, in one environment. So it's really good for large scale processing. Um, we've been using Cattle a lot uh, in TNO for our projects. Uh, we had small clusters like 15 containers. Um, but we're definitely looking into the other solutions as well. Uh, Mesos is uh, the company guided, um, uh, uh, what is it called with DCOS, uh, Mesosphere. That's the company behind it. They pretty, um, it's, it gets pretty big. We're going to present you a very simple uh, Hello World demonstration to show our continuous integration pipeline, how we put all this tooling together. Um, I just want to explain you uh, the Hello World uh, demo. It's very simple. We have two Hello Client containers. Uh, they, have their, uh, they have a Git repository. And we have a Hello Server. We built that with Rust. Uh, also in a Git repository. And these two clients, they send through curl a post message to this Hello Server. And you can see it in the logging. And we have a separate uh, project uh, on GitLab, uh, a Hello Compose project which contains a Docker Compose file for developers to put it on their own notebook or, and also a Rancher Compose file to talk to Rancher. I will get to Rancher Compose in a bit if you're not familiar with it. So I will demonstrate to you uh, Rancher and Edwin uh, after this will uh, show you the whole uh, continuous integration in the pipeline. So let me see if this goes. There we go. Um, this is the main screen of Rancher. You always start with providing your credentials. Um, this is to each user can ask their own environments. 
so you can have separate teams uh, in your company. Um, this is an example project that we have at TNO. It has about 15 containers. Um, you can see an overview here of the service names, the images they use. Is it readable? No. No. The one thing is the Beamer, which is not that sharp. Yeah, I'll that, that that increase. Now nice. that you zoom in, it actually looks way better. It looks better. There we go. Always yeah. increase the font size. Um, uh, for example, you can see also a graphical view of your uh, infrastructure with the links between containers. Um, I will switch environment. Here we have multiple environments to the Docker demo environment. That's a small Docker of Rancher. You can't switch to the environment if you're in the graph view. Docker demo. Um, here you can see uh, one stack, the Hello World develop stack. In this column, you can see the image names. And as you can see, we use tagging. We have a develop tag. So this version, these three containers, they run the develop uh, version of our software, not the production software. Um, I will just guide you through some of the menus on the top. The catalog that I mentioned in, uh, in, uh, in Rancher, it has like a public catalog with lots of software that you can deploy, uh, GitLab, uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana. Um, when you deploy it, you can provide some details and it will uh, put the containers in place. Uh, we also have this, uh, you also have this host tab in your environment. Here we have three hosts for the demonstration. We have two servers uh, running in our own network. Um, this one, docker-demo.sensolab.tino.nl and docker-demo-dev. So this is for the end user. And the left one is uh, our development environment for the developers. And at the right, we also have one container run or one host in Azure, just to show how that works. And as you can see, what, uh, what Rancher did, it spread out the containers over these three hosts. But what you can do with Rancher, you can la use labels on your hosts. Here we have hello.role is production, and there we have hello.role is develop. Because our DNS, Docker Demo, points to this IP address. And we want to make sure that the server of our demo, of the develop, also runs on the dev servers. You don't want the main front end, or if you use a load balancer, that the developed version runs on your production software, because then the end user will see the wrong version. You use labels for that. We will, I will show that in a bit in the Rancher Compose file. Um, registries, cool feature. You can add your own registries here, your private registries. Why would you need to do that? Uh, for example, if you have a host in Azure, it needs to pull your Docker containers, images. And if, you, if Rancher does not know about your uh, credentials of your private hub, then it will not be able to pull those images. So you provide them here, and through the Rancher agent container, it is able to pull these images. At least that's what I believe. You can also maybe do it directly. Is it uh, pulling only from the existing registry or can it manage a registry? Sorry, if it... Does it have an embedded registry its own or did you just... No, no, Rancher, Rancher does not provide a registry. You, uh, we use the GitLab container registry of course. Uh, and we have a separate private registry running which is outside of GitLab, but you have to provide that your own. Although you can easily in Rancher on the host start the registry version to container you need some configuration, but uh, you can do it with, from Rancher. There's actually a catalog for Yeah, it's probably in the catalog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, registry. Oh, nice. Easy. Comes with the UI. Ah, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, then there is the API. We use the API uh, from our GitLab runners to automatically. Uh, bring a new developed container in place, but Edwin will, Ed will show you that. Um, so let's go back to the stacks. I only have a hello develop stack. I will show you now how we can bring up a production stack. So I will open up a shell uh, here. And in here I have a rancher compose uh, dot production file, uh, a YAML file. And in here you can see it is like a regular Docker Compose file, with the exception that we used labels here. And what you will also notice is that instead of using develop tags, we use version tags, like 1.3, 1.7, or you could use latest. 
but this is like a special label that you will only find in a rancher compose file. And this means that the server container of the production stack will only will try to find a host that has the hello.rollisproduction tag so that it does not uh, get on the developer environment. And the rest is a uh, normal Docker compose. Um, oh wait. I, something went wrong there. Ah, no. Nothing. Ah, good. Um, Ranch Compose Production. Uh, from Ranch, you can download uh, a, a client utility here, download CLI, in the bottom corner here for Windows Linux OS X. It is a simple binary file, and you, you can use this file like Docker Compose to talk to your Rancher cluster. How does it do that? With the API key that you can generate from the web interface. So you have a URL that you can talk to, an access key, and an access token. I have loaded these uh, as environment variables in, uh, in my shell. And what I can do now is, uh, if you can read it, is it okay, this? Mm -hmm. Uh, a range to compose with dash p, you can say the stack name, hello production, with dash f, I can provide the file that I want to load, and like docker compose up and detach it. So I can press enter. It is creating the stacks now, I can actually show it to you here. It's now trying to pull the images, activating the containers, and voila. So developers can, from the notebook, talk uh, to here, or you can just do it manually, but we don't like this usually, so just use the client. Um, so I brought up um, this, and now I can show that if I go to Rancher, no, uh, Docker demo, and then not development, this is the development. Ah, this is our internal network, sorry I did not connect to the VPN. There we go. This is the developed version. We have just some sample output just to show you guys it is really the developed tag. And now I can show you how brought up the production. And this runs on the 1.7 uh, tag. Are there any questions so far about uh, Rancher? Because then we will move on on how we do continuous integration with all this using GitLab and GitLab runners. Yeah, I saw that you were uh, running Rancher OS. What are your experiences with that OS? They are, uh, but I just speak for the projects I, I work in and uh, what I've been using. They are pretty good, very good actually. Uh, it's a very small operating system. Mm -hmm. It used to be 20 megabytes, I'm not sure how, how big it is now. Um, and the operating system itself is also mostly built around Docker. So all the components you, say, you will typically find in the distribution, they, they also build it around Docker. It's very lightweight and it works very well for uh, or Swarm and uh, Kettle clusters. Did you um, manage to uh, get system administrators to uh, put that on hosts or only on a development environment, so, for instance? Uh, the, the, yeah, the thing with, uh, with, uh, with TNO, with most of our research projects, we can do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly developing prototype software, but if we do tend towards production software, which we have not done that much with Docker yet, then maybe that's another question. Uh, but that is not really that we encounter yet, uh, those kind of questions. But it is a good question. Uh, we've also used other hosts, uh, Ubuntu, but uh, CoreOS, uh, also very good experiences with that. Atom? Sorry? Have you used Atom? No. No. Any other questions about Rancher? Otherwise, yes. yeah. Uh, does uh, Rancher support uh, SE Linux in that kind of uh, like extra security frameworks in uh, OS? Uh, Rancher OS. Ooh, good question. Um, I don't know it at on top, on top of my head. Okay. I don't know it. Maybe Edwin? No. no. Actually, I don't think so. But I'm not sure. No, I'm not. I'm pretty sure it's not, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Are you uh, running um, Rancherize on bare metal or on a virtual machine? Uh, virtual machine in this case, but I have run it on bare metal as well. Yeah, uh, we we want to uh, like Pixie boot or yeah. 
but most of this, these are on, uh, on uh, virtual machines. And you can show once the host page with uh, that one uh, VM is actually in Azure right now, and two VMs are in our uh, network. Yeah, this, this page you mean. Yeah. yeah, you can see the differences in IP addresses, the public IP addresses. This is, uh, these are our public IP addresses within TNO. And this is a whole other, uh, maybe, well, I mean, this is a whole different IP address in Azure. But internally, these containers, they share the same network. Um, and you had a question about how to add a new host. If you press the add host page, then you can see, you can also do it automatically with scaling features. You can provide your credentials for Amazon and brands, you can do it for you. Or you can do it yourself using this docker run command. Here. Mm, very hard to read, but yes, yeah. yes. You said that there is an API on the Ranger side of things, right? Because if I were to bring a bare metal server on my own premise, and mm -hmm. I want to do that automatically, so that when the server comes up, and I want to, I want to make it a Ranger agent, then I can just query the API, bring the whatever command I need to run, and then once the server is up, you, you need to run this command on an agent that you want to bring up within Rancher. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and I can bring this command programmatically using it. Yeah, you definitely can. If, you, if you're able to SSH or whatever into your node the, the, that you want to bring up, mm -hmm. then you can do this all automatically. But, uh, it's, only a pseudo, it's only a Docker run command that you have to run, since the agent runs in a Docker container as well. So it's, as long as you have a server that runs Docker, you can use it as a rancher agent. Very easy. I think, yeah, that's the one question. Okay, how well does it scale? Because you say you can run uh, Mesos on top of uh, Rancher. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not on top, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I know the the uh, state service is just a MySQL database. So, uh, have you actually tried running thousands of nodes? In no, this? no, we haven't. No, definitely not. So. Uh, what, for example, what Ranch did this with Kubernetes, I believe this is the same for Mesos, they containerized the uh, components of Kubernetes in their own containers. So that's always a stability question. If you're really in production, you maybe not want Ranch to do that with their own containers. You, you probably want to set up a proper infrastructure for Kubernetes yourself, maybe without containers or with. That if you want to run Kubernetes in containers, it's possible, like Ranch does. That's something you have to decide for yourself. If you really have production software with lots of users, maybe you want to do it yourself. But uh, Rancher can do it for you. Uh, I believe the MySQL database you told, I believe Rancher, in, in the beginning they said we do not support multiple Rancher servers, but nowadays I believe they do. So they talk about replication and so on. But it's an ongoing process. Um, if it's really production, we don't do it that much, uh, it's questions you have to keep in mind. So very valid question, yeah. Okay, I think we will move on to Edwin's part of the presentation, and if you still have questions, you, we can always answer them on the end, of course. Okay, so what uh, Johan uh, displayed us was already two great tools. Docker, of course, of the only Docker community, and also Rancher for performing the host platform. Um, but actually, the real topic of uh, our talk is CI/CD. So, getting from a source code change really to a production uh, update and having a separate uh, development environment. So, the second part of the presentation uh, right now will also focus on this part. So, um, for this, I will start with uh, introducing the stack we use at uh, TNO. I think um, who, who already knows GitLab? This is the GitLab logo. Okay, that's really, really good. Um, we have our own uh, GitLab uh, server uh, running at uh, TNO. And um, for the people who don't know GitLab, GitLab is a uh, Git version uh, control system uh, and also manages your uh, releases with uh, Git tags. Um, and also GitLab provides GitLab runners to actually run your uh, automated uh, tests or your automated uh, deployment uh, steps. And also, it provides a way to uh, have issues, uh, wiki pages, and uh, that stuff. Um, Docker, we have seen it, but in our stack, we use it actually at uh, for two reasons. The first one is a build task environment. The GitLab runners actually use Docker containers to run inside their uh, the, your build job, so it can be a compiled job or a unit test, for instance. Um, and also, we use Docker to actually 
package our software and to put it to our development uh, server or to put it on uh, production. And as Johan already displayed, we use Rancher to have a separated environment, hosting environment for uh, Docker, uh, for uh, the development uh, stack and also for uh, production. Um, so these GitLab runners, uh, because I put a, s a special slide for this in uh, the presentation, uh, because it is always good to understand what this does for us uh, in the system. Um, so we actually have two types of GitLab runners. You have the Docker runners. They run inside a Docker container and uh, your build tasks, which is uh, assigned by the GitLab server, will run inside that container that you specify. So you specify always an image. In there, your compile step or whatever is performed. You also have shell runners. Shell runners is nothing more actually that you can execute shell commands on a uh, yeah, virtual machine uh, that you own. And we use them both in our uh, uh, CI/CD stack. So how it basically works is that we have the Git repository at our CI server. You push your code uh, to there. And what the GitLab server does is, uh, okay, there's a new push and there are some tasks defined that should be executed. So the GitLab runner, for instance, a compile job is started. And um, yeah, after the compile job has finished, hopefully successfully, uh, some artifact or some uh, binary or a jar file or whatever uh, comes out this uh, build job. That one is shared uh, again with the GitLab server. And after it, you can have a separate stage. Stages are always executed subsequently after each other. So the second runner, which is a completely different virtual machine, um, in this case a shell runner, will also do a GitLab checkout uh, automatically and also share the artifact from the previous build step with this uh, other runner. For instance, in this case, the shell runner will create a Docker file and um, we'll also push the Docker file to the Docker registry, uh, registry which we run on our GitLab server. And after it, we have a complete image that contains our binary from the first build step and uh, some other things which are in the Docker file of this repository which are also combined in an image together and are centrally available in our registry. A good uh, thing to realize is that indeed we use Docker in two places in this diagram. We use it for our compile environment. Typically it can be an image of 600 MBs. Um, but the image we really create is only the runtime environment. It does not contain the compiler, does not contain uh, your build tools or uh, some checks you want to execute. And in the demo version this is only a 2 megabyte uh, container because it only contains the binary of this thing. The great thing about the GitLab uh, runners is that they are distributed. Sometimes people ask him, okay, so you use GitLab at TNO, so you have probably 10 servers running for the entire de uh, department. Well, that's not the case. We actually have only one GitLab instance, but we have many runners, and runners are just separated VMs or even a physical uh, machine. As an example, I've put a, uh, the configuration file of such a job. Um, I hope everyone uh, can read it. Um, is it this file just lives in your uh, root of your uh, Git repository, which runs on uh, GitLab. Um, in here, since this is using a uh, yeah, Docker compile step, it has an image defined. This is in our internal uh, GitLab uh, repository or our Docker image host. You define a script. This can actually just be uh, different uh, shell uh, steps, best commands which you run inside the Docker container. In this case, I only perform a compile step with the cargo command, which is of the Rust programming language. You can define some artifacts, which will be shared with later stages. And here I have 
with the compile stage, but maybe the second stage uh, is to push an image to the repository or to perform some automated uh, acceptance uh, tests. We have tags to select the right runner, since we have many of them in uh, one project. And we have uh, also the uh, cache, uh, which is preserved for later runs. If you don't have this, Cargo will, any time you run a new uh, uh, compile job, it will download all dependencies again. If you define the cache, it is uh, shared between builds. So, that is what the GitLab runners do provide us uh, for automation in our uh, pipeline. But since we're using Git and uh, it's a real CI CD uh, mechanism, we should, of course, also think about the branching uh, model. Um, typically, what we do in projects is having a master and development uh, branch. And the development branch should typically uh, put back to the master very frequently, uh, of course. And the master branch should be stable. In the master branch, there live uh, some tags. And the tags are the stable releases uh, of the master branch. Since we're using Docker, you, of course, want to have uh, a one-to-one -one mapping with your Git environment and the versions which live in the Docker registry. So for that, um, we have this one-to-one -one mapping. So every uh, stable tag on your uh, every tag on the stable master, we also have a Docker image available in our Docker registry. Um, for instance, another commit with the tag. If there is no tag on this one, there is not a uh, version number in our uh, Docker registry for this, one, for this one. And since 1.1 is the latest uh, in, the, in, in this example, it will also get the latest tag. So you always pull by default the latest one. Um, we can also have uh, tags on our heads of the uh, Git repository, which we just name by the uh, name of the branch. So, for instance, if we have a feature branch or a hotfix branch, uh, automatically also a uh, Docker container is published of the head of it um, with the name of the branch. Um, to get a bit more clear how um, the entire pipeline looks like, uh, what we use at uh, TNO, uh, this diagram shows it. Um, on the left, we have the developer. In the middle, we have uh, the two uh, Git repositories that uh, Jon already uh, displayed. We have the Compose project, which contains all the orchestration between the containers. And we have the Hello Server project, which contains uh, the source code and the Docker uh, files for our uh, server. And for instance, if our developer pushes a commit to the GitLab server, um, it will in step two, automatically compile it inside the Docker container. In step three, uh, the Docker image is uh, automatically built afterwards. And in step four, we will push it to our central uh, Docker registry. Step five will trigger the other project, that's an uh, internal GitLab trigger, because uh, we want to hap have something happen in another uh, uh, project. And this one will automatically uh, give a yeah, trigger to our Rancher environment. Actually, the Rancher Compose upcomment that Johan already displayed and seamlessly is our development environment updated. So this is not for production, only for development. And what Rancher <coughs> will do in the last step is, of course, if it receives a trigger, you should update. It will perform a pull from our central documents. We also have a production environment in our uh, example. Um, and for the example, we decided that uh, that is always performed by the developer. If it performs a git merge to the master branch and put a tag on it, um, but the upgraded uh, is performed manually by updating the uh, rancher compose uh, file that you displayed. Sorry, one thing. Number five. Who is it actually triggering? Like a runner or how do you... Actually one GitLab runner just performs a call request to the other repository which is a trigger at the CI uh, server. Mm -hmm. 
the GitLab server. Is it clear? Three person, other GitLab runner in the Helm Compose project. Yeah, it's just a hook to another uh, project. <coughs> um, finally, um, in GitLab itself, the pipelines uh, that we showed graphically looks like this. So for instance, this uh, pipeline above uh, shows the steps for the development pipeline. So first we have the cargo test, which is just to run the unit test. After it, we have defined, as an example, two compilation steps, one to create one single binary and one with uh, shared libraries. In here, we create a Docker build file. After it, if everything went uh, successfully, we will do a push to the registry. And finally, we will uh, trigger the deploy project, which does a rancher uh, update. Um, also, the same pipeline, but then for a tag. And the only difference is actually that we push releases also to the public hub. And finally, uh, the deployment here happens, uh, which is also just releasing the Docker file, but not doing a seamless upgrade. So now I will actually uh, display what happens in here. In uh, real life, so I will make a code change. this one. So at this point there is uh, no change made. Of course I prepared it because I don't want to uh, program uh, for you. Uh, <laughs> so this is the change I made. Um, actually I just changed uh, this to do into uh, really printing the IP address. So before I commit, I will of course show that the current version, which is running right now on uh, Rancher, uh, doesn't have this. <laughs> so in here we have the development stack again and the production stack. I will make it a bit bigger in a second. I hope that works. Can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. So this is actually the log and this is still rolling because the uh, clients are working right now. And it prints hello from B and afterwards it prints uh, hello from A because we have two clients uh, connected to one server. And in here we see the to-do which is uh, we also have seen the source code. Now we'll close this one again. And of course, perform the push that triggers uh, everything. So if we go now back to the GitLab server, and we refresh this page, we will directly see that a build is running. So if we click on this, we will see that uh, all stages afterwards, and the first one is already running. So if I'm fast, I can actually show the output of this one. So we have seen, I also included one unit test, which is, says that it is okay right now. And now within a few minutes, I should show this page. What now should happen is, of course, when all the steps are completed, that we will see a seamless upgrade of Rancher. So in here, which is not really readable, is now written active. And it should change to uh, an upgrade. And after it, to active again with the new version, so we have uh, to wait for it. The problem is I always click back to the GitLab server to show that the last phase is uh, happening, and then we miss the update, so I will now leave this page uh, running here. 
maybe a question <coughs> so far. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, I'm keeping an eye on the yeah, active I'll, state. I'll keep an eye. <laughs> what are your uh, experiences with the um, Muso as library for the projects? Because I know for Rust it's probably the default, but no, it's it's uh, not the default uh, for Rust. The default is just to use uh, shared uh, libraries and uh, Libc yeah, and, and all this stuff. Um, but we use it just in this example, so we could also use a uh, Docker file without shared libraries, just to make it uh, smaller actually. But the standard is uh, the standard one, the other one. Yeah, with uh, GWC. Yeah, exactly. But no, but no. No specific experiences like, oh. wow, this breaks when I'm using Muscle and so No, at least the, the demo application worked really well yeah, okay. with it. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it's now happening. So now it tries upgrading, and if I press the I here, we will actually see, it's really hard to see, that it goes to red, and the new one will start after it here. Now it's changed back to active. So if we look into the logs uh, right now here, we should see two different IP addresses. And they are actually displayed here. So this is also the internal IP addresses of the VPN connection, of course, because this is all uh, Rancher uh, internal. Um, so this was the demo to see the entire pipeline in a very uh, quick update uh, working. Any questions? Yeah, I had a question about, so you said you were waiting for it to say updating, but how does it actually update? Does it like stop the, the container and then start up a new one, or does it, is it like a zero downtime thing? It is a seamless upgrade, so uh, the, the, you mean the update within Wrench, that happened right now. Yeah, when you updated the container. What Wrench does, it starts uh, first a new container, after it's, it starts, uh, it kills the old container and it makes the new one active. Uh, but Rancher does not do any um, HTTP seamless upgrading. So if there is an active HTTP connection or a SSL connection to the old container, I think it will not uh, update that one. <coughs> like HA proxy, uh, it's not a real seamless upgrade. It's a seamless upgrade of having the container ready and starting the other one, but not with respect to the network traffic. Uh, what, what, just in between, what you can see here is the GitLab uh, runner task, which is in the Hello Compose project. And here you can see we are using an uh, image that includes Rancher Compose. And then we just used Rancher Compose client that I used demonstrated earlier here. We used that in a GitLab runner um, with the same JAML file that the developers use. And here you can see upgrade. This is a parameter of Ranch Compose with a specific service name uh, in your Compose file, each uh, with the Docker service name. And that is passed on as a variable with, uh, with, um, with GitLab runners. So if, you can s if we go to the Hello Server project uh, here, and we look at the, oh, this is too big, uh, files and look at the GitLab CI file here. You can see as a final stage, the curl, this is just a thing you can copy paste in GitLab runners with the variable name of the service that you want to upgrade. And this is like token ID. This is, this is a thing you can copy paste in GitLab uh, easily. And also an optimization that you only restart the client or the server depending on uh, what server is updated, what service is updated. that you um, upgrade production menu. Uh, what is the main reason for, uh, for doing that? Um, that's actually just for this uh, demonstration, but also in real life uh, at Tino we currently don't do automated uh, updates to production. Um, at least not in the projects, not in the projects, uh, we, in the projects are. we are in. No. Um, also because of your CICD pipeline should actually be completely perfect because if uh, your if there is some flaw in a test uh, of your pipeline yeah it will succeed if the test sets okay and will come automatically uh, on your production environment but in theory it's just the same pipeline for development that you could have for production but your quality assurance should be really high if you want to have that but uh, like Johan said, uh, 
to one company. Yeah, look, there are lots of there companies. Are many do it. companies yeah. They do have some checks in place, of course, but they do it multiple times a day to production. Yeah. How do you deal with rollbacks? Does Rancho help you with like if, if you decide okay it didn't work out? Yeah, if uh, what, what we do here in uh, with the develop stack, we basically tell Rancher don't do a rollback, just just uh, we, we 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 find it okay. But maybe you can show it in uh, or well like production. Uh, you can, for example, also in production uh, here. I will increase it a bit. You can also do upgrades to the user interface here. You can tell Rancher which version of that uh, 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 of the image you want to upgrade to, for example, 1.4. And when you do upgrade, I'm upgrading to the same version now, so it's not really doing anything. But after it is upgraded, there is a there's a check, and you can say rollback, or I've checked everything, it looks fine, and uh, there we go, it's upgraded now. And they have two options. It looks okay Finish or over. And actually, it has these old containers still. Uh, it is not active, but still in place. So it can, uh, uh, if you do a rollback, it will pull back, uh, put back the old container. So this is for the manual rollback of your production environment in this example. If you want to do a rollback of the development uh, stage, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a get referred. And then the runners will do actually the same steps and put a new version online. Then you also have the complete traceability that you did a rollback. More questions? Uh, why did you choose uh, shell runners? Why you put that you stop Docker? That's a really good uh, question. Actually, we started with doing it in Docker and Docker. Mm -hmm. um, the first reason we observed is that if you want to do Docker in Docker, you have to have the container in privilege mode, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, you give the same access uh, to the host machine as if you uh, did, uh, did, you don't do it. Um, and also, we actually want to have uh, a caching mechanism, so your layers are cached, that uh, really speeds up the development. Mm -hmm. And if you use Docker in Docker build, uh, the good thing is that you have a clean environment every time, but your build takes longer. So that is the main reason to speed up. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. Yeah. Have you thought of uh, uh, unikernels looking at um, for more security reasons? It seems something like TNOs should be interested in. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> the Docker and security is a topic that we want to do more uh, research in. Uh, but at least the projects we I'm not aware. Maybe there is a project currently at TNO uh, in the information security department that does this type of work. And um, uh, actually, at the moment, uh, I will in the future research these kind of topics. So good suggestion, but it's not something we've been doing in the recent times. This took a lot of time as well. <laughs> but security is important as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, then I think we will uh, finish. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>